soon. Hopefully you back home or where you are at, maybe at your office can see me as well. A very good day and welcome to this webinar. It's the very first one out of the impact program by Tilburg University. This is where we are right now in the cube. Maybe you can see it. It's actually a very nice big auditorium, quite empty because it could easily fit like 200 or 300 people. But today I've got some guests with me and obviously you as being the viewer um, for this webinar on youth in times of Corona. And we've got uh, several researchers and also people who work on programs for youngsters in Corona times to discuss what they are researching and as well what they found already. So from your left to right, we've got Hedwig van Bakel, Ton Wild, Hagen and Loes Keizers. And uh, in this very first part, up and until 4.15, we will zoom in on what they found in their research so far. And then after the break, this will be about 4.25, we'll zoom in on more future ideas by two other speakers that I will announce shortly after. But maybe uh, a very, very quick get to know each other. If you would be on a birthday, whenever it's possible again, like a Friday evening, and you would bump into random new people, how would you introduce yourself, Luz? Can I start with you? Yeah, of course. Luz Keizers, I'm an associate professor in developmental psychology, and I study teenagers. Um, what do they need to thrive in life? How can parents support them? And here's my secret, secret element. I'm a little bit of a geek and I really like statistics. You do like statistics, actually. Yeah, cool. Tom, how would you introduce yourself? Well, I'm a professor in anything that is related to work. So whatever, work, unemployment, training, social security, labor relations, so the whole world of work. Thank you. Hedwig? Hedwig van Bakel. Uh, I'm a professor in infant mental health. Uh, and I study uh, babies, especially babies, toddlers, preschoolers, and their parents. Excellent. So you cover various age ranges of these young people. What I didn't tell before, but what is actually is true. My own name is Rudy van Beurde. I'm the host. I'm just super curious about what people are doing. So I go from organization to organization to ask them anything. But I'm not the only one being able to ask the questions because in the Crowdcast software, you are able to put in your questions and they will pop up on the screen right here so I can ask them as well. So if we come across something and you want to ask either one of them something, just shout it out there into the chat and we will be able to uh, respond to it. But maybe, Tom, we can start with you first, because we actually did one of the podcasts already. This is the online live webinar. Maybe people will view it in the replay, but there will be also additional podcasts. They will be in Dutch. We were here before last week, a little bit spooky with the two of us and a lot of lights. They went on and off whenever. And we spoke about the Dutch labor market for especially young people in Corona times. Before we dive into that, if we talk about this topic, youth in times of Corona, what do we talk about? What is actually the canvas we will be working on in this very webinar? Well, the main thing is whether young people will be able to make the transition from school to the labor market uh, during the time of crisis. And it has become more complicated anyway since the last crisis, and it will be more complicated in the current times. And what are the reasons for it being this complicated? Well, one thing is that very particular in this crisis, because of the lockdown, some sectors have been put on hold. I think of events, tourism, uh, restaurants, bars, and they typically employ young people. Uh, so even if we go to the terraces and bars more than we could do, uh, the employment rate will be quite rather smaller uh, than it used to be. So all those young people that thought this is a good education because this is where I would like to work, I want to organize festivals, events, um, they, they, they might, might really run into problems now. Mm -hmm. So obviously unemployment in the Netherlands, like in other countries, 
is rising. Um, this morning on the news radio, I heard that even in the upcoming next month, maybe another 8,000 companies will fail and go bankrupt. But are young people asymmetrically being hit by unemployment? Or is it spread evenly amongst well, that, that's, ages? That's better. two kinds of problems. One is trying to make this successful transition from school to the labor market. But the other thing is the young people that are already on the labor market, uh, they typically are employed in what we call in the Netherlands flexible relationships, uh, so flexible contracts. And the, the rise of the number of those contracts has been quite extreme in the Netherlands. And so in general, four out of ten people are in flexible kind of relationships in the labor market. But for young people, it's, it's more than half. And so it means that your um, employment security is less solid. Mm. And so now that the, uh, the companies and the organizations are reducing staff, well, it's like, you know, you're the, the last one in and the easiest one out uh, because you're, you have this, um, this flexible contract. So for them, it's actually not such a good thing to be as flexible as they were before because they leave the job more easily. Yeah, if if, con if companies adapt, they through it by reusing uh, the, the flexible shell. And this is, um, well, where the, the, the young people and the school leavers, they are there uh, overrepresented. Uh, so it means that, uh, you can already see that in the in the figures now, uh, that the, the rise of um, employment is especially the rise of youth employment and especially of the young people that are in those contracts. Yeah, definitely. We talk about youth. What age range has your personal interest? What would you like to focus on as a researcher? I mean, my interest is very broad, but uh, in, the, in this case, if we talk about youth, then it's up to 27. Uh, and not saying that 28 or 29 is a different case, but that is also uh, where policies also um, fit in. Uh, so um, anywhere from, you know, 15, uh, to 27. Yeah. And we saw some of these reasons for the so-called gig economy, like flexible contracts. This was happening already, like delivery boys and girls, you know, racing on their bikes through the city to get hot meals delivered at people's homes. So this was going on before the pandemic, obviously already. What did the corona, the COVID pandemic add to these factors for the youngsters to enter the job market? Well, it's also important. Many of those jobs are also side jobs for students, also for our students. Eh? So it's not only young people that have made a, a, a well a, a final transition eh, from school to those jobs. Eh? So the people that are in school also have those jobs, but they also need them. Eh? So our students also need the side jobs eh, to really have an income eh, to to be able to well to rent a room or or anything. So what changed, of course, is that in some ways um, the, there has been, of course, a growth in those activities because we've been ordering pizza from home. And so the people on the, on the electric bikes came and brought the pizza to us. But in general, if you look at the, um, uh, well, the bars, the restaurants, um, events, etc., cetera, uh, this has been really locked down. So uh, some jobs have increased also in supermarkets, more young people were there also to clean uh, the cars and any, anything. But um, this um, platform development um, has been developing faster, uh, very fast, and, and that will also continue. Uh, so uh, this is a bit the modern labor market. And young people are already in the modern labor market. Uh, some, some older generations are still in the more secure, typical jobs. And that's the main difference. Yeah, because that's actually my following question. Is this something job security, and this didn't quite fit in the length of the podcast that we already uh, put on tape, do we need to seek for job security? Because you told when the mic was off that in some other countries, the whole view on job security is different. Is it something we have to embrace in the Netherlands as well, that you simply would not have a job for the upcoming 20 or 30 years? I mean, there's nothing against flexibility. Uh, uh, people also want flexibility uh, to be able to like work from home. Uh, but the main thing is uh, whether this flexibility is without any modern kind of security. Uh, so my main concept that I develop is flex security. And flex security means that you are being supported. And the, so the issue is not so much 
that your job may end because it's a short-term job. But if there is a if there there are facilities in order to move to the next job or to be able to invest significantly in training so you can do other jobs, then the flexibility is not an issue. But in the Netherlands, uh, we have sort of two segments now, the stable jobs with all the investments and the flexible jobs with very low investment. And that is, I think, the real problem. And what would be some of these facilities that you are supporting, suggesting? Well, at least have access to uh, proper training or have an individual account where you have means uh, for training because training is expensive. Uh, and currently, uh, this is really depending on your status on the labor market. And so it's rather unfair because, especially if you are in flexible jobs, you be, need to be able to move on uh, to other employment. Um, so actually, the arrangements in the labor market we are still using are more like the 1950s. Right? And the young people are really in the... 2020 labor market situation. And so the institutions, the organizations, the rules didn't catch up with the developments in the labor market. And is then the pandemic, this COVID-19 period, the time to discover these opportunities, to implement these, or isn't initiative being taken fast enough already? But you will not be able to adapt, you know, that quickly because it's more like a systemic reform that you have to do and there's no time for that now and the money goes now to try to keep people in the jobs that are still available and the sad thing is that we experience the same thing uh, on a lower level uh, maybe than now in in the, in the previous crisis but we didn't really do much so we got stuck in the in the same political debates and didn't do any reforms uh, so the question is whether we will do it after this crisis But the main thing is now to use, you know, what we got to offer the support uh, and then, of course, move on to the more systemic change. Uh, but because this is lacking now, the support structures are not efficient. So we have to combine what is there regionally in the industries, in the sectors, what the government, uh, the central level can do. So we have to, to be very practical uh, to offer the support for those uh, quite vulnerable groups. Yeah, yeah. And there's a uh, there's a question popping in. What is your advice, Tom, for young people leaving school at this moment? Well, the advice, of course, is to first keep in touch with your school. And your school wants to know what you are doing. And they might also be able to help. Uh, maybe uh, you might return to school. Maybe not for full education, but uh, they can also support you. Second, if it takes too long uh, to find employment in the um, in, in the domain, in the sector uh, where you did your studies and courses for, then think of what else you could do. Um, the problem is that we have sort of influenced young people to have rather small job dreams. Um, and that is okay. But uh, if it doesn't work, uh, so you have to be more flexible. If you wanted to organize festivals because you are, you know, really good at Uh, organizing things and the festivals will not be there for more than a year. Uh, think of what you can organize in the healthcare sector. If you are a very good uh, organizer, well, lots of organization is, is, is needed in that sector. We've seen that when we had to bring people uh, from one hospital to the other. So think of in terms of your skills, not just your courses or study, but think about the skills that you have, develop the skills And then even maybe on a temporary basis, move on to something else. You can always return, but don't stay at home. Don't uh, really only watch, uh, try to go to play Fortnite free. You have to be active. Uh, so that is the main thing. Don't just sit down, uh, be active, build a professional network, talk to people and see what you can do on the short term as well. Yeah, keep moving actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Tom. We will be back with you, but first, Luz, we talked with... Tom, about the, the, the step from yeah being a student to find a job, it's difficult at this time maybe. A lot of youngsters stay at home. You are so interested in this very age group, like the, the, the young pubers we say in Dutch. How do you say that in English? Adolescents. Adolescents, that's it. Um, how, how are they doing? Because you follow them with one of your researches. Maybe you can tell something about it. 
Yeah, actually, at the moment, we're doing tw uh, two research projects. One is uh, the called the ADOPT project. And we had been following already approximately 200 families for uh, two weekly surveys for uh, five times. And then the lockdown measures were taken. Uh, and now we're still following them. So we have quite good overview of what has changed in family situations where adolescents live with their families. Um, and what we see is on average that things don't change very much in terms of whether they have conflicts or how supportive their parents are. But the differences between families have tremendously increased. So we see that on average there are no changes, but for some families the situation really gets worse. And for other families it gets better. So don't be fooled by the average. If you look at uh, what's happening to youth nowadays, for some there might be beneficial effects, and for some there might actually be harmful effects, for instance, for their mental health, for the family situation. I think we need to be sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one project that is currently running and we're really monitoring what's going on in these families. And then another project, we're actually trying to really support adolescents to really support them in this and times of insecurity where they really have to cope with daily stress. And because they're young, they don't really have the life skills that adults have to cope with stress. Mm -hmm. So we, together with Erasmus Medical Center, we've built a Grow It app. And at this point in time, 800 youth are playing the app, it's a serious game, and it challenged them every day to get out of their comfort zone, to do something, to deal with stress, to solve problems, to seek for distraction, and all these life skills that we really want our youth to have in order to be resilient against the crisis. And this gives you a very big insight already, because I saw a talk uh, of you some, some time ago by the University of the Netherlands, Universiteit van Nederland, in which you said, I as a researcher cannot simply follow all these youngsters around and measure how they are doing and what they are doing. But the smartphone is the answer to get this data actually out of them. But which young person would voluntarily put in this data into the app? So. Can you tell something about the Grow It app? Yeah. What makes that they get hooked into it? Well, we developed it together with adolescents. So we asked adolescents, like, if you want to know yourself, how your emotional world is functioning, how you can really deal with daily stressors, how can adults best support you? And actually teens, they say, like, I don't want to go to a psychologist. I mean, I'm so ashamed if I would have to go there but they would like to play a game in a team and be challenged to learn about themselves, to get to know themselves. They're super curious on who they are themselves because they're forming their identity. So basically what they do, they play in a team, they build together on a tree and they get points for doing daily challenges, but also for reporting five times per day, every day, how they're feeling and reflecting on their feelings. To give you an idea, by 800 children, they're now in the fifth week, 800 kids have been asked five times per day a super short questionnaire on how they're feeling. So we're actually at this point, real time, tracking how they're doing, how their emotions are developing, whether they grow as a person. And what is the age group of these youngsters participating? 12 to 25. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And it's an actual tree, isn't it, that they built on? Well, it's a virtual tree. Yeah, true. <laughs> they but can it looks, get yeah. gifts for that tree and they build it together. I think that's the, the team element makes it work. Sweet. Yes, nice. And another group of children are very, very young children. Hedwig, you kickstarted two research projects actually within this time of Corona last April. Can you tell something about this and as well the age group of young, young children you're focusing on? Actually, uh, we have uh, three projects. Uh, one is uh, a project uh, focusing on uh, parents. Uh, parents uh, during times of Corona, how do they uh, manage their uh, parenting skills? Uh, it's all over the world. It, um, we had a baseline measure two years ago with 40 countries all over the world, Western countries and non-Western countries. And, and now, in times of Corona, we have the opportunity to uh, see whether parents in different countries with different lockdown measures uh, can do their job as a parent and whether they are stressed, whether they are anxious, whether it's more exhausting to be a parent in those times. 
So that's one of the projects. And uh, we have another project, and that's on uh, pregnant women also, uh, whether it's difficult to, have, uh, to be pregnant uh, in times of corona, because they can't see their uh, midwives so often. Uh, there are restrictions. Uh, partners uh, cannot go with them to the, when they go to the midwives or the, to the, uh, the hospital. And uh, the final project is the Baby 2020 uh, study uh, in which we uh, will follow children born in uh, the three months of, uh, yes, lockdown, uh, intelligent lockdown here. But um, whether those parents uh, experience their parenting task different and uh, giving birth to a young baby uh, during those times, it's uh, different than uh, uh, before the times of Corona, yeah. so we are very interested in that. And these researchers are now all still running, isn't it? Yes. So we it's still hard running. to see what's popping up yes. out of the results. Because how do you do it? If you are you sending out questionnaires like yes. to the international yes. countries? Um, I'm very interested in doing uh, observational studies. That's my main focus uh, before the corona. Uh, but nowadays we uh, do a lot of uh, surveys and questionnaire studies and we um, get a lot of information uh, from questionnaires also. And uh, finally, I hope to do more in-depth uh, observational studies. But for those times, it is uh, very good to have questionnaires and survey studies. Yeah. And in the earlier research, you also already focused on the child and conflict and crisis situations. Now that parents also had to homeschool, maybe that's an extra dimension. Do you have children yourself? Were you yes. locked in with children? Was uh, it stressful or were um, you blossoming as a family? Yes, I have uh, adolescents, so uh, I don't need homeschooling. They do their schooling themselves. So okay. it's easier for me. And I think there is a lot of difference between parents. Uh, if I think I'm very lucky to have uh, pubers, uh, so we call it in the Netherlands, 15-year-olds, uh, and because um, they can do their homework, they can uh, do, uh, they can chat, they can uh, uh, do games, etc. So that's different than when you have a, a toddler or a very young child. Uh, and you have to play all day. That's really different. Or you, when you have to do your homeschooling for your children, uh, you have to learn them uh, words and uh, math and everything. That's really difficult. I heard from colleagues uh, with school age uh, children or very young children, it's very hard. So in that way, I'm probably lucky to have uh, all the children. They can. Uh, make lunch themselves and uh, i can do my work online so uh, yeah they're more it's, it's independent, different obviously it makes a lot of difference yeah thank you hey luz we talked about your app um is it also available in english yeah we've had this question several times before unfortunately it's not because we had to comply with all the gdpr rules and all the security measures and therefore, our first release was in the Netherlands. So at least we would be sure that all the data are totally safe. The privacy is uh, guaranteed. But it is our ambition, indeed, in the, in the next five to eight years to really implement this in other countries. And have been, we have also been invited by a network of medical centers to do so. So this is to us the start. It was actually not built as a corona app. It was built for other uh, studies. But it was just released like on the day of the lockdown and we were supported by NWO, the Dutch Organization for Scientific Research, to release it sooner for a more broader population. So we were also very lucky with that. So now it runs for about five weeks, isn't it? Five weeks indeed, yeah. And, and what, it, what will be your next steps? Because you're discovering some results, or results already. So what we see in, in the first place is that um, some of the negative emotions among adolescents are already decreasing with the school uh, lockdown being uh, uh, released. So we see that during the corona crisis, they were a little bit higher on loneliness and on irritability, which might very well be related to family situations because we also saw that for some families there were more conflicts. Um, we now see that irritability and loneliness is decreasing slightly, but their concern is increasing. And we had actually not expected that. 
but we related to school that has started again. So they have maybe stress concerning grades or exams that they have to take. So we see that uh, there's more divergence now in the, in the negative emotions that they experience. Um, that's, that's one insight that we have. So we, we also publish weekly updates on the emotional well-being of adolescents on, the, on our website, growwithapp.nl. Mm -hmm. It's in Dutch though. Um, so, but then the next steps is that we're going to ask all these participants to provide us with feedback so we can make the app more adolescent proof, more fun to play, more motivating. So this is a first step in really building, uh, building a strong app that really appeals to adolescents so they can work on preventing mental health problems by building really these life skills of coping with stress. Yeah. And is it just free to download for people and available to grow its app? It, it was free to download if you had a login code from the research ah, team. You needed it. Yeah. So they first filled in a baseline and after filling out the baseline, they got a free code to play it. Um, so they could play it for free for six weeks. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Um, and, and, and then th th there's this little voice in the back of my mind, like with or without COVID-19, growing up, being an adolescent, it comes with some wind coming from in front you know there are some hurdles along the way and it's just part of growing up that not every day is a walk in the park is this something that we should just take as being part of life or should we as a society act upon it and do something for these youngsters who yeah, experience uh, loneliness or whatsoever yeah, I think, Ton, you already gave a good uh, start in suggesting what society should do for uh, for adolescents, for youngsters. And I fully agree that we should be very careful with this young generation. I mean, this is the future potential. And these are also, for the older people who are listening, these are also the people that need to take care of us. So we better take good care of the next generation so that they're resilient and they have an adaptiveness to deal with changes. Um, I think there are a couple of concrete things that we need to consider as a society, as adults. So first of all, most teenagers are super resilient. Okay, they're not immediately changed by three months of, of negative emotions or stress, but some do. And even in one of the studies, we asked adolescents to rate their quality of life on a 10 point scale from one to 10 and 18% gave their life a five of lo or lower. Whoa. their life just at this moment failed in their point of view, right? So we need to be very careful for the 18, 20% who is not doing well, or we need to support them so they don't get a depression or an anxiety disorder at this moment, because we know that if you had one during your adolescence, the likelihood of developing psychiatric problems later in life just increases tremendously. So I think that's important that we, that we take very good care of our youngsters and, and the, it's, it's also tragic that at this point, the care for youngsters is not well arranged. I mean, there's a huge waiting list for seeing a psychologist. It's a huge hurdle for adolescents to visit a family doctor. And adolescents also don't necessarily want to talk to their parents. I mean, some have super nice kids, but some don't. And they don't want to disclose everything. So if you're an aunt or a neighbor, or if you know adolescents in your personal surroundings, talk to them. Tell them that it's okay to have stress, but that it's not okay to not deal with it and teach them coping skills. Go outside, do something fun, ask for help. I think as society, we really need to take care of the youngsters. Yeah. And the app is actually providing them with some very practical advice as well. It's not just measuring how they are doing the 800 youngsters, but each day they get like a task or a challenge to do. Can you mention some of those? Yeah, they get a challenge every day because we notice that they do the stupidest things online, right? If there's a TikTok challenge and all the adolescents do that or they eat a spoon of cinnamon. And then we felt like, isn't this a mechanism through which we can also give them other challenges? So one of the challenges, we know that going outside is good for your mental health. Like if you set enough steps on a day, it's good for you. You release stress. But we thought it was a bit boring to ask, to, to give homework to teenagers saying, hey, you need to take a thousand steps today. So instead of saying that, we said to them, if you know, if, if you make a photo of a chicken, 
then you have manager challenge of today. So they also went outside to seek for a chicken. And it was fun because they could get a gift for the team tree. And these are the challenges amongst others that they get. Where would I go if I had to photo, like take a photo of a chicken? I, I, I would have no idea. It cost me like 40,000 steps, I guess. But that's a very fun way to, to bring it, actually. And another one on a more mental level, which you mentioned before as well, is just, just simply call a friend and ask for my own personal qualities. Like ask the other person what I'm good at to, to have this conversation on a deeper level. Yeah, indeed. So I think the the challenges are very diverse, but they are uh, they are based on cognitive behavioral therapy and really the coping strategies of which we know can prevent uh, mental health problems or the emergence of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you, Luz. There's another question popping in for Hedwig. So you received seed funding for your research. Was it easy to get, or is it a very big hassle? Uh, I think this is the seed funding from the university, from ah. uh, our uh, faculty. Yeah. And that was for the Baby 2020 uh, research uh, project to start uh, the first uh, wave. Mm -hmm. And um, because we need uh, some funding to uh, recruit families and it's easier, it seems to be easier when you have a little bit of uh, funding and you can offer uh, participants uh, a little incentive. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, additional uh, uh, funding from the university and uh, we hope that we have a group of uh, parents with uh, newborns that will um, go on in the next wave in which we can uh, maybe give some uh, home visits and see how the children uh, develop. Because we think that especially those uh, children who are born now, they have a really different time than uh, other children because um, visits uh, were not allowed, P parents gave birth and there were no happy family visiting the newborn child, how lovely uh, the newborn child uh, would be. So it's, and for some parents we uh, know that they liked this quiet period. Not so many people around them, only time for the uh, new baby. Uh, and some uh, parents uh, think it's awful not showing their baby to uh, the whole world. So that can be another start uh, for those parents and we will see whether finally it will also have uh, effects on how the parents feel in their uh, self-efficacy as a parent, how, um, how uh, secure they feel, how uh, they think uh, I can manage this uh, task as a new parent. So I hope uh, the funding will give um, flow to more in-depth studies. And can uh, families with newborns can still admit? Can they register yes. for this yes. research? And baby, how? Yes, baby 2020. Uh, and then you will see the site and you can uh, uh, enroll. So I hope uh, they will. And then you get these online questionnaires. Yes, you they get have a phone call. Or, yes. Yeah, so they have to Google it, baby 2020. Yes. And then they get on and the page they, uh, find. Yeah. So university, excellent. All right. So there's another question. It's still a little bit uh, small, I guess. Mm, there it comes. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, that's a, that's a nice one. Someone of you came up with a question. How do not so stressed adolescents, so laid back adolescents, deal with very stressed parents? Who likes to pick up this question? So the child is all at ease, but the parents are stressed out. Yeah, so what we actually saw also in the, this uh, ADOPT project is that uh, parents are all, all of a sudden made these extra rules. So we also asked the families, like, did you install new rules uh, in the family to protect your kid? Some parents indeed were quite stressed. Uh, some even said that the kid was not allowed to come in the house with uh, shoes and that they had to put uh, a coat outside. And there were different rules. Uh, also interesting, by the way, that the parents said there were many more rules than the adolescents recognize. So the parents think they're much stricter than the kids uh, uh, say their parents are. Typically, most adolescents actually found these new rules quite okay. So often they were not able to visit friends. Normally that would be a really a no-go if uh, parents prohibit friendships. But because also adolescents knew that it was dangerous, they were actually quite okay, but there were some 
who were really oppositional. So they really um, were angry about the rules and they came into conflict with their parents. Now the rules have uh, re been released already a little bit, so I, I assume that it's going better now. But of course, stress of the parent, if a parent loses a job, also is transferred into the family system and it affects not only the parent, it also affects uh, the family and vice versa. If an adolescent loses a job, it also affects the family system, it also affects the parents. These are all interrelated processes. So I also think, Tom, your work will also spread out to family systems and when they absorb the stress. Tom, do you actually have children and did you enforce new rules? If I did enforce new rules? Yeah, I don't know. I don't even know if you have children. Yes, I have children, but uh, they, they are making their own rules already. Okay. <laughs> at, this, uh, at, at that age. At How old are they, if I may ask? Five and six? <laughs> uh, Youngest is 23, so... Uh, ah, okay. Yeah, so uh, they can manage their own rules. But, uh, but the main thing, of course, is that... Um, I mean, the, the circumstances of, of growing up uh, are very important because they sort of have a, a major impact uh, throughout uh, well, many years after that. And that's the main thing. That's the main concern. We don't want a COVID-19 generation to develop. Uh, mm -hmm. But we know that early age problems, uh, they can lead to scarring effects. Huh? So you will be, uh, you have a false start, uh, but that can have a long-term effect and that's the main thing and that, and that is I think what, why we are interested in monitoring uh, young people uh, in a good way of course not just to conclude after two years that they have done very bad in during this crisis but to be able to um, along the way uh, as, as they move to to see what support is needed um, and and that is quite uh, the big thing now uh, so can we actually offer that? So in, in my case, I'm trying to get the funding to uh, to follow all the school leavers in Brabant, especially at the intermediate level, MBO level, which are many, many students. Because if you did do that properly, and uh, and they can also respond like every month to questions, um, also questions for support. We have support structures and we can link the young people to the support structures. But that, I think, is, 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 is a major thing now because this crisis is so very atypical. It's not just an economic crisis, there's a health crisis, but it becomes a social crisis. Eh? So we need all the effort and resources that we can, not only to be curious as a scientist because we want to know, but also because we are working on trying to get some impact from the knowledge uh, that we have and make it work in, in, in society. That mm -hmm. is also what the impact program is about. Definitely, one of the yeah. core pillars, you know, to yeah. cross yeah. the bridge yeah. between the university and societal uh, yeah. challenges. But then, if, if I'm correct, it's not only their problem, not only the problem of the youngsters, even in some years' time, but as well problem for other stakeholders in society as well. In, in, in what way? How would you see that? If, in many in a ways, broader I mean, if... if if young people do not grow up, they will not be uh, full-blown citizens. Uh, if people cannot really attain certain levels of education, uh, then uh, Brabant will not be very attractive uh, for new companies to, to come to Brabant because you need a well-integrated, well-educated um, population also of young people. So they are key assets, especially in a, a growing society. So if uh, if if young people... Uh, will not be able to really um, integrate in society. Uh, it's bad for them, of course, but it's also a waste of talent, it's a waste of investments in education. Uh, so uh, the stakes are very high about young people. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the cohort of young people are shrinking. Um, they need to carry our, well, our welfare systems, our healthcare systems. They will have to work for, uh, well, 50 years probably. Uh, so if you cannot really now make sure that they have a good start, uh, this has huge consequences and the costs are huge as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's the main thing, the main problem um, that we are facing and also the concern that we share. Yeah. If, if I may add to that, I think as I said before, like three months of slightly increased stress is not necessarily bad for development, but indeed we don't know what the scarring effect is and we don't know how many waves of lockdowns we will still have and how long this will last. And stress also accumulates. So it's not 
that they are already fully recovered from the last lockdown. And if the autumn brings another and they lose their job again, so I, I really uh, recognize what you're saying, the scarring effect, that's not only for the economical influence if you miss out on diplomas or you don't get the skills, but also the emotional problems they carry forward to the future. Having a depression once makes the probability that you get depressed later much higher. Yeah, that's right. And also the personal, you know, intervenes with the financial and economic. So people will now be delaying also uh, relationships, uh, even family formation, um, which also is a financial issue. I mean, uh, you might not have the mon money to start a family. It is already very difficult to, to buy a house as, as, as a young generation. Uh, so this all interacts uh, and, and the scarring is not only in terms of income, but also relationships, um, also being able to invest in yourself, etc. Uh, so it's a whole complex of, of factors that, uh, that interact. So what groups in society should reach out? You all already said before that youngsters should look around and see where they could apply their talents to, you know, not only in one certain direction, but maybe in another sector. But what group? Should it be employers? Should parents do more? Who should help these young people? I mean, it's, it's a joint effort. Uh, and I think you will have to apply certain standards. The standards are already there. Uh, at least, uh, and which is not really discussed much in the Netherlands, uh, but we have a European uh, youth guarantee. And the youth guarantee says if young people uh, that um, are trying to enter the labor market, if after four months they cannot find a job, then you have to offer them either a job or a new education or a traineeship after four months. Uh, that is a norm, and I think uh, these norms should be really applied. Mm. Uh, in, in my case, I would really want to declare youth, uh, youth unemployment illegal. So, because you haven't ever worked and you're already unemployed, that is silly because you didn't, uh, you don't have any history in employment. So, how can you be unemployed if you didn't really have a job first? Uh, so, I think the, the, the standards should be more explicit uh, to be able to, um, to prevent those scarring effects, and especially now in this unknown crisis. Uh, which is really also about the lockdowns. We already know that uh, the cases of burnouts among young people were already high, uh, but now with all these measures, which of course have been applied for public health, uh, that is a very risky situation. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I see the, that we have some minutes left on the clock. Maybe it's good that we have some closing remarks, like what would be your call to action, your finalization, your go-to URL that you want to share maybe with the people back home. Who can I give the mic to the word? Who likes to wrap it up loose? I want to I uh, uh, join your, uh, your words, Don. It's our joint responsibility. So if you know a way in which you can help young people, help, this is the moment. Help them with a job, help them with an internship, give them access to your courses if they're online. Ask them how they're doing, teach them how to cope with stress, help them to grow up and that they don't delay or get mental health problems. It's too, this generation is too precious. So it's our joint responsibility and everyone should help. Strong words. Hedvig? Yes, I fully agree. And then we should know from what kind of factors um, make them resilient, make parents resilient, make children resilient, because then you know what can we do in another way when there's a crisis again. Then we know what differs between the most uh, resilient ones, the most steady ones, and uh, how can we help the people um, that have a very hard time. And we can do that when we know the resilient uh, factors that uh, people have. Yeah. Thank you. Tom, final sentence? Oh, just to add, I mean, be aware that you have to, you might have to, to provide unequal measures uh, to make sure that inequality uh, in, in, in chances and, and potential is being corrected. Uh, so that you have to differentiate. Uh, there are many groups that are already vulnerable. So equal measures will not make them stronger because they need unequal measures to come to an equal situation. That's maybe quite a brain twister for the people to apply them in. Yep. 
So we have to put them forward. Yeah. Thank you so much. We've got three researchers here on the row, professors and associated professor actually talking about youth in times of Corona from various perspectives and the researchers they brought along. There will be a website popping up uh, online anytime soon, youngsters in times of Corona, and it will be in your screen so you can click on it and view the page. Now we've focused on these researchers. After the break, which is about 10 minutes, we will have two new guests and they will yeah, look into the more practical things that we can do to help these youngsters. They came with a, a statement that it's a societal challenge that we should pick up all together, actually. So if you can do something, uh, be our guest. Thank you so much for you joining here on a safe distance. This is totally in line with the, the impact program of Tilburg University to reach out and to link with societal challenges. So good for you to be watching us right now and hope to see you back in about 10 minutes time. Thank you so much.
Welcome back. Here we continue again. This is part two of the webinar, Youth in Times of Corona. We're still here in the Cube. Join me as a new guest here in real life, Leon Smits, director of Sterk House. Maybe it's nice to introduce yourself in a moment, but we also have Yolanda. She's sitting, I guess, back home in the attic. She feels a little bit sick, but praise to her that she's here in on a live stream with the Zoom software. She will introduce herself in a minute as well. But maybe we can start off here with Leon. Thank you for joining me. Sterk House, tell me all about it. What is it? Do you want to know everything? No, not everything. Maybe first <laughs> kick it over the introduction, please. Yeah. Yes, uh, Stack House is an organization um, for youth care and the, uh, the, um, the care for uh, women and men who have to deal with domestic violence. And we also do the care for refugees, uh, young refugees who come here without their parents. And this is an initiative that's been active for years and years yes. already. Yeah. Now in the recent times, in Corona times, you've seen new things arising, developments. No, we didn't see real new things, but we saw things going sharper. Because we also, we always see that the problems we meet, they didn't exist in a short time. They are um, uh, uh, often uh, based in economic shortages or uh, less possibilities. And we see that now things are going sharper. All right. We will zoom into that in a moment time. But first, we move to the Zoom software. If I look into that camera, I guess Yolanda will see me as well. You're seeing that. Let's see if the sound is good. Can you hear us, Yolanda? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent. And you're connected to Tronzo, the yes. academic collaborative center youth. When you're not sick and you're working for them, what is your task? Uh, I'm a research coordinator at Tronzo. Uh, it's actually a department of uh, uh, the University of Tilburg. And... Um, uh, before the break, we had uh, three scientists, and uh, actually, I'm a scientist as well. Uh, but in the Academic Collaborative Center Youth, we work together with 23 organizations, and um, they are preventive organizations, but also youth care organizations. Uh, and Sterk House is one of them. And uh, we try uh, to collaborate and do uh, researches, um, especially on, on youth. Thank you. And I try to coordinate that, so to bring people together. That's my main task. Mm -hmm. And then these organizations obviously visit families as well, normally, and this heavily changed? Uh, yeah, some of them, just uh, like Sterk House, but we also have uh, public health uh, services, and uh, they sometimes also visit families, but uh, most of the time uh, families go, uh, go to uh, the public health uh, center themselves. And we also have um, University of Applied, um, uh, uh, applied uh, University. So um, there's also education. So uh, it's a quite uh, diverse group of organizations uh, which work together in this uh, collaborative uh, academic center. Yes, thank you. So maybe you can add to each other as well, if you, if you like to. Back to Leon, you said already before, some of these things you're seeing with these families are sharpened. Yes. What do you mean with that? Oh, at Stack House, we always think we have to work in two ways. One way, when the problems are really big, then we have to be uh, have to, to to be to to give a good treatment and work on uh, sustainable solutions. So, but what you always also see is that the problems developed in years and years. So, I always think, why are we? so late. We have to invest in prevention. We now are fighting a running battle 
while we should uh, invest in prevention to stop all that big problems because the problems are not all individual problems they they um, uh, come from the families you live in when your chances are less then you your risks are higher and we can see that way before that's where uh, Mr. Den Hertog and I met uh, in combining the, the knowledge of our clinical practice and our dream to be uh, more close by the, uh, the, the coming of the problems, not always work on the, on the end. Yeah. So we made uh, a program, Smart Start, where we can see what kind of problems are coming here instead of waiting they are big. Definitely, yeah. Maybe if, if, if you hear the echo too much, you can lower the microphone yeah, a little that's bit. That's, really that's, that's the trick. Um, but but what, is, what are some of these problems that you're encountering? To, to, to give no, me an but, example. But I think uh, quite a lot of the problems we think are, uh, uh, they look like aggressiveness or they look like uh, self-mutilating or uh, really uh, the anxiety. They do have their ground in a not so good start. We think it's an individual problem, but I think in 80%, the problems we see as an individual problem are really economical and uh, pr uh, problems who have to, to make uh, its, its uh, ground is in a lack of chances. And the families that children are born in had that same lack of chances. And it's only, yeah, it's only, yeah, yeah continuing in the same yeah. way, actually. Yeah, the, the difference between the haves and the have-nots. Have yeah, yeah. So, Yolanda, you're sitting there at your attic, and um, it's so nice that you're joining us with the, with the um, software. Is there something the university can contribute to what we're seeing, what they are stating, that there is a you know, widening gap between the haves and have-nots. What can universities do? Um, now, what we do in the Academic Collaborative Center is uh, to bundle the knowledge we have. And um, uh, uh, we find it quite important that all the knowledge we have uh, um, are uh, shared with each other. So we have uh, um, scientific knowledge and uh, that's okay, but we also have uh, practical knowledge. So the knowledge of the professionals working with families, um, they, they see a lot and, and they have a, a lot of knowledge, but also the clients themselves have knowledge. And what we are trying to do is to combine all these uh, sources of knowledge together to uh, to improve practice. That's and it, in, in uh, a nutshell what we uh, try to do with our academic collaborative center. And how will you distribute this package of knowledge? Is this available on some places already, or do you hand uh, it out? In, in a yes, of course way? we have um, um, yeah a website, but uh, only a website is uh, not enough. Um, uh, I can give you an example, um, uh, together with uh, Avance, that's uh, uh, University of Applied Science, um, with the teachers there and with the students, but also with the youth professionals and um, uh, with parents, uh, we developed a tool uh, which can help youth professionals when they have a, a sort of conflict with uh, with parents and um, it, it can help them to um, um, in their shared decision making because uh, we know that's very important um, when a, a family has problem 
problems that they um, share their problem with um, um, with professionals, but that that they have the same idea what is going on. And uh, we developed uh, a tool for professionals, and uh, this can be found. Uh, uh, actually, it was uh, launched in Corona time, and uh, it can be found at bramtool.nl, and uh, it's free. There's uh, freely uh, access. So, um, yeah, I would invite youth professionals to look at it, and if they have uh, complaints or uh, suggestions. Uh, please let us know. Uh, there's an uh, email address on this website. So please let us know if uh, yeah, something uh, doesn't work or maybe uh, some things work very well. We like to hear it. But that, that's the way we try to share our knowledge. Bramtool.nl. Leon. Yes, perhaps I can add a little bit of the meaningfulness of science and uh, the, the, the research because we work together in Transo, but we also at Stackhouse work together with Smart Start and the Data Science Center, Center Data. And at Stackhouse, we have a little team, only two persons who do research for the problems we have to deal with. And at the moment, we do research to find the best treatments for the victims or of lover boys. We do it together with uh, several uh, organizations in the uh, Netherlands. And also, we uh, are uh, doing uh, research to find ways to prevent children that they have to go to closed youth care. We are an open organization when problems are really big. You sometimes do not know how to manage, but we do not want to send that child away because they, again, they feel I'm not good, I cannot stay. So what can we do? And we, uh, we try to do that in a really good uh, way. What can we do to uh, uh, combine the means of open and closed youth care. And we do have to, go, to do good research interviews. And I think that for big problems, we really, really have to make steps to give good answers. In youth care, it's too normal that you do something while you do not know if it's work. And I saw uh, uh, a question, what is the main uh, thing youth care should uh, um, uh, manage in the, f in the next five years? Mm -hmm. And I think we have to do two things. In the big problems, we have to see that they have years of coming and that you must know that prevention has the, re that's the real answer. So skip the word of youth care and make family care. Now we think youth is the problem. They aren't the problem. It's the outcome of lack of chances. And I think it's really sad that we say youth, difficult children. I see little difficult children. If I had had that kind of start in life, I would have been a difficult child too and a terrible child. So let's try to make um, uh, that change and please, and then to uh, what Mr. Wildhagen said, make them have school. And I would have to, prov uh, pro uh, you said, uh, it must be forbidden to, uh, to uh, uh, not having work, not going to school would be in the, uh, a big um, uh, but her stuff, uh, a punishment. A punishment for me too. It must be forbidden not go to school because school and work, they are the ways to an own and uh, yeah, your own life. So. To form your identity, yes. develop yeah. yourself. Yeah, and you actually you you say look at the bigger picture, also to the par parents, the structures that they're in. It's not only them who are causing problems, and you should signal problems way before actually yeah 
Yolanda, we only have a few minutes left for this very part of the webinar. What would you say, what could people do back home when, whenever they work with children or maybe their parents themselves to support children and young people still having enough chances to develop in this very strange time? Um, yes, of course, I'm a scientist and I, I, um, it's difficult for me to give uh, practical uh, advices, but uh, I, I think this um, uh, crisis can also help us to look at uh, the way we have arranged now um, the youth care, just as uh, Lian said. We, uh, uh, we should uh, invest in uh, prevention and um, a couple of years ago, in 2015, uh, we had a great uh, structural uh, system change, the transition, decentralization from the province to the municipalities. And one of the uh, goals was uh, to lessen specialized care and uh, invest in prevention. And now we are more than five years ahead and, and we still do not see any, now we see changes, but not that much. And I think um, now we should learn from, from this period and, and new things, new initiatives uh, that have been developed, um, which we can also use in the near future. Yes. Thank I you. I think that, that will be uh, great if we can make such a step in the near future. Yes, thanks for sharing your advice, Yolanda. Leon, if people are curious for Sterk House, where, where could they see more information? How could they reach out to you? On our website, uh, sterkhuis.nl. Sterkhuis.nl, that's very it. Very simple. That's it. Yeah. Yes. Leon, thank you very much. Um, we're going to close this very part of the webinar and someone else will take over your mic. It has to be clean, though, um, thanks to COVID. So thank you and might see you later on. Thank you very much. So in this time, we had Leon and Yolanda sharing their thoughts and insights on more practical matters on, on how we could work with youngsters in these times. It's not only them causing problems, not at all. They're mostly just like the outcome of a bigger scenario, obviously. Um, this is the very first webinar of the impact program by Tilburg University. And we will deepen the things that we discussed on also in three um, individual post podcasts. In Dutch, I will be interviewing some of the guests that were sitting here with me, including Tom and Luz as well, to share their ideas um, well, in a podcast, which goes a little bit deeper than just this panel setting that we had right here. The impact program of the university is, I said it before, there to bridge the knowledge being gained here by scientists um, with real life initiatives out there. Um, and one of the founders of them is very nearby in a Zoom session, but the mic is being handed over to Tom. He will appear anytime soon in this big hallway here in the audience in the cube. Let's see where he is. He was totally dressed up for the occasion. So it's hard for us to tell who's all logged in right now, obviously, because normally the seats here would be filled, but now you're there back home behind your screen, or maybe you're walking in the park, just having your earplugs in. But coming down the steps is our well-known professor, Ton Wildhagen. And uh, I'm going to hand over the mic to him. And then the stage is all yours. I guess we've got a camera up there, Ton, right in the middle. It's all yours with your beautiful sweater. Okay, so, well, now of course we dealt with the topic um, and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And we have some uh, also announcements after um, what I'm going to do now. But what we do today is something uh, that has developed and produced by the impact program of our University of Tilburg University. So for the, the people that uh, do not know uh, what we are doing at the university, the topic that we dealt with is about how can you make impact with knowledge in society. 
So this is not so much a natural thing to do for universities. Universities started with research and education, but we developed at Tilburg University like a third pillar. Yes? And this is the impact program. Impact program has a team and the impact team um, now also has to do something which is a bit of a sad occasion because one of the initial impact leaders, Dick Den Hertog, well, is leaving the impact team, I think for good reasons. In fact, he already left, but this is the occasion to say goodbye and to thank Dick for playing this very important role in the impact program. And of course, it has stimulated a way of thinking and doing at the university that, well, is now represented but by what we did today. So um, this is the thank you to Dick, Dick Den Hertog. And I want to say a bit about his role in the impact team and impact program. So um, imagine when we started, it was like um, a boy band that was created. Uh, some people will, of course, know One Direction, or maybe take that in a uh, further past. And um, I just want to check if, if Dick is really there and listening, because Dick can probably talk back. Yes, I'm here and I'm yes, listening. Yes, Dick is there. Okay, so uh, in case you weren't listening, we could have stopped already. But okay, so I'll continue, Dick, because uh, we had a manager, uh, the former rector, Emil Arts, and he casted three people for the impact team, for the boy band, because it was a boy band initially. Now it's no longer a boy band. So there were three people. Dick, Johan Bunnelin, who very sadly passed away. And that is, um, well, that is something else. Uh, so we, he is still in our mind and in our hearts. And I myself. So, and in any boy band, you the, the main thing about creating a boy band is that you take different personalities in different styles, because for the fans, and they have to fall in love. Some will fall in love with the, you know, the wild one or the easy one or the whatever. So uh, this is a bit our history, I think, uh, Dick. And um, we were three personalities. And I think Dick was very important because he came from the biggest school uh, in economics. And uh, that school uh, also have many people that are very strong in the original well, uh, conception of science and, and what you do in a university. Uh, so it was very important that someone from this um, very strong school joined the team. And initially, um, Dick seemed to be in the boy band, the one that used to say, well, no, this is something we have to not do it that way because scientists will not like this. We will do, we have to do it differently. No, we, we don't need a leaflet with all the colors. They don't just want to read paper and, and they're not, they don't like fancy things. Um, I myself was a bit of a wild one, always in society saying, you know, society thinks that we should do this. And Johan, uh, he was the middleman. So he was in between. So if you look at Dick's profession and history, you might think that he was sort of the more dull one because he is a professor in business analytics, operations, research. And actually, and I saw that when we were at a, a radio station a long time ago in Amsterdam, but he read books with only formulas. So you could say this is typically a soulless person, you know, who only reads books with formulas. But the story of the boy band is that I think Dick actually became the most, well, soulful person in the boy band because uh, he also created one of our slogans, Science with a Soul. So we got to know Dick as a very soulful man, as a, um, as a person that is also a very true soul, a, a very genuine soul, a natural, natural person. So this became very interesting in our boy band because, because uh, Dick played that role and uh, because uh, the others could also play the role, I think we managed to kick off as a boy band. And um, 
Well, there were not only just the, the normal activities that we did, which were quite abnormal because they were new, but we have, I have seen several situations which leads me to the conclusion uh, that Dick actually, uh, the best way, uh, apart from saying he is really a true person, uh, also in terms of uh, a deep soul and emotions, you could say, yes, he's a soul man. And um, there are some lyrics, uh, one of, I, actually, um, I have this hobby being also a DJ next to professor. So this is, um, if we can present it, apart from um, Sam and Dave's uh, famous hit, um, I'm a soul man. And I think this represents what Dick is. Can we get that on screen as well? We might be able to do this. And if it doesn't come, it's coming. Yes. Okay. I keep talking because it's coming. Because I was just looking for a text that would really typify Dick in a good way. And oh, Dick can see it. And um, that I, I'm being informed. And the public can see it. So I, I, I don't see it. Okay. So this is, I think, actually, um, and now we can see it. Yes. Dick maybe comes from a dusty road, you know, geographically a bit of dusty, dusty road and came to the university, but he carried good loving and a, really a truckload of that. Uh, and I think that is uh, actually, it really um, typifies his contribution, but also um, he, Dick as a person, there is a link somewhere. So if you want to hear the song, um, I, I think expect you to know it. Of course, it's a classic one. But uh, you can play the song, sing along, uh, maybe in your own lockdown uh, situation. So, Dick is a soul man. So, um, we have a present for you, Dick. And, um, well, we managed to um, already uh, bring it to your home. And you're now allowed also to uh, open the present. So, I'll be watching you if you... Uh, there may be a, an assistant also in your home that could actually help doing those kind of things. I'm yes. From heaven now. <laughs> okay. So Dick oh, is unpacking uh, and um, he's opening it now. And also, of course, the viewers will see it. They might already be seeing it. But um, the main thing, of course, is that Dick unveils, unpacks the present that we want to give to this soul man. Fantastic. And as you can see, it, uh, it's a picture as good as we could. Um, science with a soul, that's his motto. He's a man with a mission. And you will see all the ideas, the prizes that he got, the ideas, the new initiatives, every meeting, there was always a new plan. So this is the way we see you, Dick. And um, this is also the way that we will keep on seeing you because we will remember you wherever you go. Uh, we know that you have new roads to travel, new dusty roads or shiny roads, whatever. But um, you will be in our soul. Uh, we'll be watching you and we'll be seeing you. And really thanks from the Impact team, of course, also the program managers, uh, which are, are actually our tour managers for the, for the, for the whole enterprise of uh, the Impact team. So thanks for doing what you did. Thanks for, doing, for being who you are. Keep doing that, keep being that. Thank you very much, Dick. So many things. So can I also say a few words? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, okay. So many thanks, uh, Ton, for the very uh, kind words and uh, also um, for this uh, very nice uh, gift. And I will certainly um, put it on the wall behind me such that I can uh, see it every day. And um, so the impact team is uh, forever um, not only in my heart, but also uh, in my room. Um, yeah, so it was a wonderful time that I had with uh, you, the Impact uh, uh, team. Um, you know, it's such inspirational and also powerful to share the same vision, and the same passion. And that is indeed science with a soul. To use science to make this world uh, a little bit better. Yes, a little bit, but better. Um, it, has, it also makes me very happy to see that more and more people, more and more researchers from our university become interested in um, also using science to make this world a better place. 
and especially more and more young researchers. And I think that's a really very uh, uh, promising and a nice uh, development. I'm also happy uh, to tell you that um, I can continue by my, my dream, yeah, the science is a soul. So per October the 1st, I will switch from university. I go to the University of Amsterdam and there I will set up a lab analytics for a better world. So together with uh, MIT, um, I will set up a lab and also use analytics, develop new methods to, um, yeah, to apply it also to all kinds of applications to make this world a better place. And I'm sure that I can use a lot from what I learned from uh, you, Tom, and the others from the impact uh, team. And uh, yeah, that is, I think, very um, helpful and valuable for me also for setting up this new initiative. So many thanks for the um, wonderful time that I had with the uh, impact uh, team. And um, I would say uh, goodbye, science with the soul mates. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll hand over to you. And just to to inform our viewers, uh, yes, we have a new um, boy member, Hein Fleuret, in the band, but we also have a female lead singer now, Marit Sitzkorn. So that has changed. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tom. Thanks for your words and your nice festivities here with the present being sent over so quickly to the home address, address of Dick and Hertog. Um, we're going to close it up. It's uh, nearly 5 p.m. Thank you so much for viewing this very first online webinar. Maybe you're viewing it in a replay. There will be URLs for you to check upon. Maybe it's tilburguniversity.edu slash youth and corona. And we will be updating those. And we mentioned the podcast as well, in which I will be talking with some of the members. Luckily, beneficial in times of corona, nearly an all-woman panel. Normally, you see all these gray, elderly, wise men. We didn't have any one of them uh, today, but it's, it's a very good um, development. Thanks for, for tuning in into the cube here at Tilburg University. And might see you later on in another times or maybe on an edition of Youth in Times of Corona. Thank you. Have a good one. <laughs>